listening to this, it means Eternal Crusade is dead and we've all gone back to playing Space Marine. But how did this happen? Well, get ready guys. Today's story is the fall of Eternal Crusade. December 19, 2012, it started with a company going bankrupt. This company being THQ. THQ had to start selling assets to the highest bidder to pay back the 50 million they owed. Any assets that were not sold were simply forgotten about and put in the bin. Two of these assets was Dark Millennium and the Space Marine IP. Sega decided to buy one of them, but then decided not to do anything with it. This left Dark Millennium online to die and fade away. And I have to say right now, I'm so sorry to the developers of that game. The amount of assets I've seen that you guys made that were just put to one side and forgotten about shocks me to this day. It just shows how cruel the gaming industry can be and at some point I will be making a full video about it. Anyway, Dark Millennium Online was going to be a massive multiplayer online role playing game. Wow, that's a mouthful, by Visual Games. As you can imagine, when this got cancelled, there was a lot of upset Warhammer fans. Everyone lost hope and thought there was never going to be another massive multiplayer Warhammer 40k game. Oh, how they were wrong. It's June 11, 2013 and it's E3. It's time for an announcement. Eternal Crusade was shown off for the first time and it didn't take long for the media to catch on and they were already comparing it to Dark Millennium. And this is important as they were given references and assets for use. Later it turned out they couldn't be used. Something about them being modelled in different engines. But Eternal Crusade had been the game everyone had been waiting for being an MMO. But who was making this game? Well, it's about time you met the team. Hello Crusader, my name is Miguel Caron and I'm the head of studio for Behavior Online. Miguel is going to be someone you see a lot in this video as he is a very important part in the life cycle of Eternal Crusade. But before we carry on, I want to talk a little bit more about the team and who Behaviour are. Let's start with Miguel. Miguel had passion for the Warhammer 40k IP and you could definitely see that from the start. He collected the miniatures and even knew his lore very well. And the entire studio for Behaviour clearly had this passion as well. Everyone working on the game so far was a massive 40k fan and apparently had two armies each. This is probably one of the reasons why their pitch to Games Workshop was so good, as they knew how to respect the IP and had a clear vision for the game they wanted to make. And Miguel was definitely bringing the right people for the job. Behaviour is providing the talent and expertise they've acquired over more than 20 years in the business. Adding to this, in my time in the industry, I found a number of veterans who stands out from the crowd and I've brought many of them with me to Behaviour. Victory needs no explanation. Defeat allows none. Hello, I am David Gosland. I am the creative director of uh, Warhammer 40,000 Eternal Crusade. Vanessa Gosling, marketing producer. I'm Brent Ellison. I'm a lead game designer. Mathieu Vecto, associate producer. I'm Patrick Baltazar, lead programmer. Yeah, I'm Olivier Tremblay Ross, game programmer. I'm Jonathan Maillé, and uh, I'm the artist. Hi, I'm Stephen Lumpkin, lead level designer for Warhammer 40,000 Eternal Crusade. Sean Fosso Mercurboros, programming director. I've been role playing and, and gaming in the Warhammer 40,000 universe for years, so I'm thrilled to join the Warhammer 40,000 Eternal Crusade team. In multiple interviews in 2013, Miguel had stated that he's bringing veterans into Eternal Crusade. One of the best examples of this was David Gosland, who had worked on AAA titles such as Far Cry and also had experience in the gaming industry of more than 15 years. But Miguel had always said that a lot of the people on his team were MMO veterans. But what about behaviour? Well, at this point, they weren't known for quality games and also had no experience with MMOs. They were mostly known for turning movies into games and Naughty Bear. Yeah, looking back now, that game was definitely teaching kids to be psychopaths. Miguel had said that this game was his project. And when Funcom didn't want to use the license, he brought his team with him to Behaviour. This is why he adds in the interview that they are the best studio for the job. And this is not uncommon in the gaming industry. 
developers can switch between studios a lot of the time, and with Eternal Crusade it seems that's the case. This means that even though Behaviour might have been inexperienced in MMOs, Miguel was bringing the people in that knew what they were doing. So now you know a little bit more about the team and behaviour, let's move back to Eternal Crusade. After the announcement, Miguel started to do presentations about the game. A lot of people kept comparing this game to Dark Millennium, but Miguel had always stressed that this game is not Dark Millennium. In one interview, he even boasted about not making the same mistakes as Dark Millennium going financially bankrupt. One of these presentations was him actually describing a simulation of what the game would be like to play. to you today is a simulation in which you will take part after this uh, explanation and this uh, strategy meeting that we have together uh, explain to you the eternal crusade uh, it's something that uh, these four in parallel soldier have been able to uh, go through with success and protect the empire it all makes sense now he was sent from star wars to ruin warhammer 40k games jokes aside as the Thunder Arc departs, your team surveyed the area for enemy activities or point of interest. After some discussion, the team has convinced you to head westward to a nearby underworld entrance where ancient relic may be found. Your duty is to recover them and reclaim them. And so your words, um, should we not destroy these Xenos unit, these Xenos, these Xenos artifacts? This is something that the Inquisitor, the Lord Inquisitor, will have to decide. Regardless, Astartes, you will be your norm for the return. The squad encounters fierce resistance to their progress in the form of the Eaters, the Tyranid, the World Eaters. Okay, so let me explain what's going on here. Essentially, Miguel is explaining what a player would experience when playing Eternal Crusade. They would select their character and log in, and then choose what mission they would want to do. For this particular scenario, it was invading a Tyranid Hive. Now before you say that's not very lore friendly, Miguel had always said from the start that Eternal Crusade is a simulation which allows for all these enemies to be in the same place. So once we have uh, the Astropath ready to create a simulation for you, uh, you will select the type of character that you want to play uh, in, this, uh, in this planet. Miguel then carries on saying that you can meet up with your friends in your cruiser, allowing to build your party. After suiting up, your team will decide to come in their Tundra transport. Okay, so you go down to the planet, you raid the Tyranid Hives and you get your relics. But what comes after that is where things get interesting. Miguel then describes as you come back up to the surface that you join a battle with thousands of players between Space Marines and Chaos Space Marines. With no interruption between what you just did and what you're about to do simultaneously going from one piece of gameplay to another. Miguel was describing an open world Warhammer 40k game. Briefly talking it over with your squad, you decide to join the friendly forces advancing on this fort. You drive the Razor back over, advance on foot to guard it from fire. Now, this definitely turned a few heads, and people really started to like Miguel. He seemed like a down-to-earth person that wanted to make a great game. People started shouting from the rooftops that Miguel was the man for the job, that he was going to create the game that everyone had been waiting for. Of course, you did have your skeptics, but people didn't listen to them and heed their warnings. Get out of here, you're ruining all the fun. October 18, 2013, and it's time for some hype. After the interviews and panels that Miguel had done, people started flooding to the forums and everyone wanted a say in what should be in the game. From collector's editions to people wanting pets, there were a lot of suggestions. People clearly saw the potential in this game. And for behavior, they clearly knew they'd stumbled across something great here that's going to be the next big thing. But you can make all the promises you want in the gaming industry, but delivering it is the true challenge. It's June 25th, 2014, and Behaviour have set sail on possibly their biggest game ever. At this point, they're about six months into their development, as the oldest footage I could find dates back to November 15, 2013. But at this point, the game was looking promising, and they were showing off a lot of content and assets to the community. But there's a reason why they were doing this. Okay, so wrapping up then, 
Where can people play this? When can they play it? So we're launching the Founders Program, uh, which is a pre-order program, uh, uh, the 25th of June with a new website, with a, a store. And basically, uh, the Founders Program, we decided on a no marketing firewall between the devs and the fan, and our motto is be true, be fair, be transparent. So uh, instead of uh, doing double dipping and things like that, we went with a very, very transparent approach. It's $40 for 40K. So the game is, uh, as I said, is a uh, buy to play. So once the game launched, the game will cost $40. Uh, dollars in and it's launching in the um, end of 2015 but once if you join in um, the flight towards Arcona on the 25th version in two weeks on top of buying the game for $40 we give you $40 equivalent of points to spend in the World Trader Store where you can build your package basically of what you want. But then if I build myself a, a, a Space Marine package and then you tell me you play Eldars, then I can just reset, I, uh, I get back all my points and I rebuild my package for Eldar until the game is about to launch and then you lock it because you're going to use these items. So it's $40 for 40k, gives you beta alpha access, $40 worth of items, uh, Vanguard title, uh, all your names, version, squad and everything. Uh, on top of that we give you early game module access, so a training cage, which we, we're going to launch in uh, January next year, uh, where you can start practicing your combat moves and the shooting range, and then you have later on your personal space, and then you have your strategarium when you can, with your squad, uh, plan the, the how you're going to wage war, and suddenly the bay window will open, and you'll see that you're out of the WAP around Arcona, that's one or two days before we launch, and then getting ready with your drop pod or your Thunderhawk to land and start the eternal cruise. So there's quite a lot of information there, and I want to explain what Miguel was saying for those who might not understand. In order to make a game, it needs funding and you use that money to pay the developers to actually make the game. Before Eternal Crusade went into early access, Behaviour had announced the Founders Program. But Behaviour had always clarified that the Founders Program was not a crowdfunding, and that everything in the game that had been shown off so far was already fully financed. This is where things start to get very confusing, especially for me who's making this video. Because on one side you have Behaviour who's claiming it's not a crowdfunding, but then on the other side you're getting players to pay for the game early, almost like a pre-order that's going towards helping to fund the game. So you can see how this really doesn't help. Becoming a founder obviously gave you full access to the game at launch, but you were also able to build this package. The amount of money you put in decides how many benefits you could have. For example, if you spent $40, you would get 40,000 points to spend in the Rogue Trader Store. In the Rogue Trader Store, you could pre-purchase in-game items that haven't been created yet. These could be weapon skins, armor skins, vehicles, consumables, accessories, etc. And if you had a lot of money, you could splash out on the Xenos pack costing $450 which is quite a lot of money for a pre-order. You also had inclusion to that the point bundles, which if you had enough cash, could buy those as well. One of the other things the Founders Program gave you is early access. If you wanted to be part of the first wave to play the game, you would have to buy the pack that costs $120. But if you bought the $40 pack, you would get early access, but just not the earliest. Essentially, the more money you paid, the faster you would get into playing the game. And don't forget, this is pre-alpha at this point. Now, I haven't been able to find an actual statistic on how much money was made from the Founders Program, but what I do know is that people were spending hundreds of dollars in it, and were treating it as a Kickstarter program. But I am going to come back to this later and actually talk about this a bit more. Going back to the story, around the same time Miguel was back to doing interviews and presentations about the game. With the release of the Founders Program and a new trailer to go with it, he wanted to tell as many people as possible about Eternal Crusade. They were at PAX East, E3 and many different events talking about the game. But this wasn't getting enough people into the game and they needed a new strategy of getting people to become Founders. And I'll give you one guess in what they did to achieve this. In the grim darkness of the future, there is only war. Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited for for the Warhammer 40K first impressions info dump footage galore, right? September 5th, 2014, and it's time for Hype 2.0. Behavior realized that they were preaching the game to the wrong crowd and needed to go after the Warhammer fan base. 
they did this in two ways. The first is by doing interviews with YouTubers talking about the game they wanted to make. But uh, yes, go ahead with your question, but our founders class is completely different than, than what I've seen in the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, so, I, mean I think it's about um, obviously getting that across because people just hear, especially people coming who are new to the game and look, just starting to learn about Eternal Crusade, they're starting, they, they see founders pack and then they already have a preconception in their head about what that entails. Um, and especially with things like the rise of early access on Steam where people are paying money hand over fist to play unfinished products and sometimes not even receiving the product that they were promised at the end. Um, mm. You know, what would you say to those people who are a bit wary of the founders packs and Okay, so the first thing that I, uh, let's uh, let's teach uh, your viewers the difference between crowdfunding and pre-order. Okay, because that's very important. People think it's semantic, but it's not. Uh, uh, crowdfunding, it's when you look at a package uh, that you're buying, whatever it is, or it doesn't matter. You look at the package and you cannot correlate the value versus uh, the natural value of the, something you would do in game. As an example, you buy a founder's pack for $2,000, you know? Uh, there's no video game that, that launches that no one will pay $2,000 to play a video game. Or a founder's pack that's it's called uh, Shut Up and Take My Money, uh, that is $5 and you get a thank you from Miguel. You don't get the game access, you don't get anything, you know, again, there's no correlation between what you're paying and what you're doing in game. Versus in Eternal Crusade, it's true pre-order, you know, we, it's a pre uh, our business model is an hybrid. The second was inviting out YouTubers to come and play the game. Yeah. What we did is me and Delrith here, we got we went there for like a 30 minute demo. We ended up staying two hours because we were so excited about this game. Well, I, I wouldn't call it just like the tabletop. It's like the tabletop come to life, right? Yeah, you know, third definitely. person so that you could see all these massive armies just approaching and tanks and rhinos and, and deploying the rhinos, the spawn points just it's fucking insane chaos, okay? You got your orcs, tyranids, chaos space marines, marines, space marines, and any other faction you can think of. Is it gonna be in the game? Mm, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. No, it, it, they've got plans. First of all, I just wanna say that this is not aimed at Angry Joe at all. He was just like many other people, a victim of the hype. The reason I'm using his video is because he's giving a great demonstration of what behavior we're trying to do. They were using Angry Joe and many other YouTubers at the same time to hype up the game and get people into buying the Founders program. Uh, if, if you want to go in on the game and actually contribute to the game and make sure that it's good and, and it has funding, uh, you could do a, a $40 pack. So it's, it's like $40 for the 40K game. Very clever, very yeah, clever. Very, very, um, very, very I think he said something like if he gets like 50,000 like Founders that they don't probably don't even need a publisher they could just do it for the fans whatever the fans want this was a great idea going after the warhammer fan base and it convinced many more people to buy into the founders program once again the hype train started and people were getting really excited for what this game was going to be but this is the point in the video that i've been dreading to make i need to explain why people were getting so hyped up about this game and for this, we need to go back to the beginning. <laughs> Saying Miguel promised the moon would not be an understatement. Between 2013 and 2015, the amount of interviews and presentations that Miguel had done, it is impossible to keep track of everything he had promised. And he promised a lot, and I mean a lot. Now, I could just pull loads of different clips of Miguel talking about what he promised, but I've sort of narrowed it down to the main points, which I will use clips for just to give context. So, let's get started, I guess. Planet Side 2. Planet Side 2. Uh, a Planet Side 2 scale of combat. I'm talking 500 versus 500. Massive army smashing into each other. Here, this one is a little bit more ambitious. 1,000 players on the battlefield. Massive combat RPG. How are you guys getting your head around it? 
tiny piece uh, of what it is, but with the back-end technology we have, uh, we'll have thousands of players in the same battle. And then Arcona itself, the whole planet, uh, a, a typical continent, is 400 square kilometers. That means that uh, running through it uh, at full space marine uh, speed, if you were able to do it in a straight line, it would take you 45 minutes. And with the technology that we announced recently, much different, much different. Last year uh, broke the world record for the uh, largest battle in a PC game in 3D. They had 1,000 players fighting on the same battlefield. And uh, we're going to beat that record uh, at next GDC. Uh, Steven is looking at how many uh, we can do. We're playing on the same planet, no instances. Uh, the tech that we have from a company called Much Different, based in Sweden, it's called Pico uh, Technology, uh, for our backend server. This what allow Much Different to break the Guinness World Record uh, last year with 1,000 player, a battle with 1,000 player killing each other in the same battle. We're planning to beat that. Uh, and so the whole planet Arcona is on a single server technology. So Russian, Canadian, Austrian, uh, French will all be on the same planet. No instances whatsoever on the planet. And there's no loading screens. So you just walk and, and you have to discover this whole surface. Obviously not going through enemy lines uh, because the main uh, objective of the game is actually to push the enemy lines up to the time that you can actually take upon their fortress. You turn left, you have uh, uh, you know, 500 of your friends, you turn right, you have another 500 one of your friends, your thousand, and then you see over the hill, one thousand players, orcs screaming and running towards you, uh, waiting. And as a space marine, and you look and you see on the left and right, you see you know six, seven hundred of your friends, and then you see you know, uh, uh, a Gretchen coming on top of a mountain. You like, <laughs> come on, we're waiting for you, you know. And then you see that like in Braveheart, you see a thousand orcs coming at um, uh, the horizon, you know, shouting like this and running towards you. Okay, so we can definitely tick 1,000 players off the list. And whilst I've got my pencil handy, I'll probably tick off open world as well. Obviously, if you did not understand those clips, Planet Side 2 allows for 1,000 players to be fighting each other at the same time. It's also open world, which means that players can literally run from one point on the map to the other on a giant scale. This is what Miguel planned for Eternal Crusade. Thousand player battles, fighting over Titan factories, supply drops and other key things on the map. Next up we have Free, free to, to Wag. It's free to play, you know, because uh, all the other four factions, they're premium factions, so our business model is, is like Guild War 2, so it's buy to play, except the, the Orcs boys are free to play. And then we have the Orcs. So the orcs and the orcs premium, uh, like the knobs and all these type of orcs, they're uh, part of the four faction, but we have a sub-faction of the orcs, which is the orcs boys, and the orcs boys are free to wah. You know, it's free to <laughs> it's free to play, but it's wah in okay, the orcs language. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. So the orcs boys are free to wah. So free to wag was a bit of a mess. The way this was going to work is if you were a new player and interested in trying out the game, you could join the free to wag. This would allow you to play as an orc boy, with many other new players as well also being orc boys. This was a unique way to get new players into the game, but they also started to try and monetize it by having a pioneer pack go with the orc. Miguel stated in an interview in 2014 that it was a way for players to contribute to the founders program who don't want to make too much of an investment. Once again, if the Founders program is a pre-order and not a crowdfunding, then why are they trying to get little bits of monetization here and there? There were quite a few people on Reddit who actually saw through this facade and actually tried to warn people about this. Later down the line, they do change the Free to Wag program, which I will talk about later in the video. But this does mean that I'm safe to say that the original idea of Free to Wag that was promised was scrapped and changed. These next two are a little bit confusing, but stick with me on this one. Obviously, all these factions are driven by uh, faction leaders. Uh, so there's a squad leader, a squad commander, which will lead 10 Space Marines, 10 of his friends. And the tools that he has in the game is very different than uh, the one he has specialized tools uh, that he can see the battlefield, he can um, voice over. Uh, you saw our uh, Razor press release, we're gonna have Razor come embedded on our game as voiceover with modulation so you can speak as a space marine, yeah. hear other people speak as a space marine. So he controls 10 people. Now all these squad leaders can be elected as a, a strike force commander and they lead 10 squad. And all these strike force commander can be elected on the war council and they control the whole faction on Arcona, which is our planet, 
It's a persistent world with no instance, allowing battle up to 1,000 people in the same fight. Campaign, and the campaign would be bring these very, very important at artifacts to your war council. The war council is the players that control, not control, but gives objectives to the whole faction. And you need to cross the enemy line with your rhino without getting shot. So how do you get to that level without anarchy, you know? So these objectives, how you will wage war in the game, will be dictated by uh, your, your squad captain or your squad commander, your strike force commander, as well as for the whole entire faction of Space Marine, Eldars, Orcs, and Chaos, the War Council. The War Council is five uh, players that has been elected there that will, again, give uh, um, uh, military objective. Leave the orcs alone for now on that campaign. Focus on, on Space Marine and Eldars, and because we have made a deal with orcs and we're going to dish it out at the end when we uh, killed all the two other factions. So that's a, a direction that your War Council could give you. And then your Strike Commander could say, you know, go attack this outpost. And, uh, sorry, your strike force commander could say, go attack this outpost. And then your squad commander could say, you know what? Uh, the other squad will attack the outpost, but we're gonna go di disable the Aquila cannon right beside it. So you're a newbie, you're just learning the game, and you know already what your faction is expecting of you. Eternal Crusade's campaigns were going to be player driven, and these campaigns would have been chosen by the War Council. The way this would work is that 10 players would elect a squad commander, then 10 squad commanders would elect a strike force commander, and then 10 of those strike force commanders would elect somebody to be on the War Council. The War Council would then decide what the entire faction does, for example, attack the orcs to the east. Strike force commanders can then choose to, for example, recover a stolen relic or attack an orc workshop. And then from there, squad commanders can take their 10 players to do different smaller objectives. For example, if your main objective is recovering the stolen relic, you might have your squad commander say, we're gonna secure this forward base, or the other squad commander might say, we're gonna hunt a commando squad nearby. But if your main objective by the strike force commander was to attack an orc workshop, then your strike commander might say destroy that looted tank or destroy that shield generator instead. This was going to allow for that guerrilla warfare that Miguel kept talking about, such as raids, hit and run tactics and ambushes. So what's next on my lovely list? Oh, social hub. Your character will appear inside the simulation on your orbiting strike cruiser alongside a member of your squad. This strike cruiser is your own. You can do it whatever you want with it. And if you join the war effort with other players, you can actually merge all your ships into a very large one with a personal space inside of them. Well, I don't think I need to clear this one up at all. I mean, it's pretty obvious what he was saying there. You were going to be able to have a social hub where you could meet all your friends. Uh, good old Tyranid balance or PVE. Every territory, ours, as well as the one from the Eldars, the Orcs and the Chaos, uh, are surrounded by swarms of Tyranids. Uh, all the Tyranids' territory are surrounding us. So the more you create noise, the more you act within the simulation, the more you will attract the attention of the Tyranid. So you have a lot of uh, procedural dungeon that you can go to, as well as uh, if you want to just blow up some steam, you know, your boss uh, pissed you off and you just want to release some uh, aggression, you go towards uh, Tyranid territory and it's just have fun with the Tyranid. The Tyranid is uh, our faction. Is the one we control. So, because Tyranid cannot be playable by player, because Tyranid is a mind, is a hive mind. So, having one Tyranid going around like this and doing an uh, emote uh, would break the IP itself. We had the PV element, and it just, you, f you know, you had a very bad day at work. You just want to kill some stuff. You go towards a Tyranid territory, and you have wave and wave and wave a Tyranid to, to destroy and, uh, and use your, uh, your Space Wolf powers. The Tyranids were going to be used in two ways. The first is by being used as a balance mechanic. For example, if one faction started controlling too many territories on the map, the Tyranids would start to attack that particular faction, forcing them to fight on two fronts. The second, as Miguel describes, is being a PvE faction. So if you preferred killing AI over humans, you could just walk over to some Tyranid terrain and start killing them. Miguel also describes these procedurally generated dungeons which you could go into, which allowed you to also face Tyranids. Later down the line in Eternal Crusade, Tyranids were just made to be a PvE horde mode and nothing else. So once again, it's pretty safe to say that what was promised was not delivered. <laughs> Terminators are a bit of a meme in the Eternal Crusade community, simply because Terminators had been teased right at the start, but never came out. Someone even data mined Terminators in the game, 
and the comments on Reddit are just brilliant. Don't worry guys, they're in those expansions you're waiting for. Oh wait, I better add that one to the list. Okay, warlords are next. So when you when you have like heroes, you're gonna have like a demon prince just come out of the ground and like start killing people with swords. And so shit. so the, yeah. it's not designed. All these things are not designed, yeah. but yes, that's the purpose of an hero. Uh, it's that once an hero on a five six hundred uh, battlefield, there's not gonna be fifteen heroes. You know, they they're expensive to spawn, and expensive in game currency, not in real cash money. But uh, and when one is spawned, everybody knows on the map that a Nero is despawn. If it's on your side, then everybody say, okay, we need to protect him, because if he gets killed by the enemy, uh, the loot that he's gonna give and all the requisition and everything might switch the table, and we make us lose. But if we can protect him, he can unleash his power, then we're, we're gonna win that, that battle, for sure, you know? So that's a very, very stressful moment when a hero is spawned, for everybody. At this point, I'm basically rubbing salt in the wound, and it's not fair on Miguel or you the viewer for me to do this. Also, for anyone who thinks I'm taking this out of context, the links to all the videos I use in this video will be in the description so you can go watch yourself. Putting it simply, Miguel promised a lot for this game, and it's sad to see that game never got made. But I will say, from all the clips I've watched of Miguel, he had passion for this project, and that can't be denied. And lastly, just to cement the hype and promises, I want to show you an official trailer that was launched with the Founders program, and you can be the judge if this is what you received in the game. Constant war against humanity. But wherever there is darkness, there are those who fight it. On the fringe of the known galaxy lies the imperial world of Arcona, an ancient world of secrets and hidden power. Arcona has seen an eternity of conflict, a battlefield thousands of years before mankind first ventured into the void. Countless wars have been waged across its surface. Now the armies of the 41st millennium are converging upon Arcona once again. Some come to protect Arcona, others to despoil and destroy it. Some come simply to fight or to feed, while the motives of others remain shrouded in mystery. All seek to control this world, all are willing to bleed to claim it. Yet there is more at stake on our Arcona than perhaps any yet realize. The battle lines are drawn. The time for battle draws near. Choose your faction and play as a loyal space marine. A violent and brutish orc. A hate-fueled chaos space marine or an enigmatic elder. Form a squad with other players. Wage war across a massive world. Explore the planet's underworld. Rise through the ranks. And lead your faction in epic battles. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only more. The battle for Arcona begins now. So far, Behaviour have been doing live streams, talking with their fans about what they have been working on and creating in the game, and also been active on their forums, answering any questions people might have. And people really appreciated this communication so early on in a game's development. It was one of the things that convinced many more people to become founders for Eternal Crusade. And Miguel had always stated that he was making this game for the players, not the publishers or himself. I'm just going to play a small clip of Miguel talking about this, and I do apologize for the audio, but I feel this is important to see. Nothing's gonna happen if they don't play the game. So we work for them. So how do we make sure that the game matches their uh, expectation? Well, mm -hmm. it's by involving them in the, in the game design. Right. So from the beginning, I've decided to have no marketing firewall between the devs and the fan. Mm -hmm. So I, I put a, a little, um, uh, do's and don't, you know, uh -huh. but then I trust them. And that's another thing. 
I trust my employees to create the best possible game. So if I give them the responsibility, I give them the authority that goes with it. Right. And they have to love the game. They have to be passionate with the game that we're building. Uh -huh. And you, you've seen them. Uh, half yeah. of them are 40K fans, you know? Yeah. And I'm pushing that towards the player as well, you know? So I'm not trying to patronize them. I'm not trying to... They know what they want. I'm listening to them. Yeah. And I'm changing my design based on their feedback. Even before that, uh, when we have issues sometimes, uh, we send it to the forum, to the fan, and say, can you help us fix that design issue? I don't know if we have a drop pod here, but uh, we had a drop pod model, and mm -hmm. the animator, the, the claps for yes. the space marine, it, it was not mechanically feasible from right. the model. So we, we took a picture of the model, we sent it to the forum, and we said to the fan, could you tell us how do you want the space marine to exit the drop pod? Because right now, two big space marine would they gave yeah. us tons of solutions and there's one engineer that actually drew a model to exactly how it would work and that's the solution we took and we wow. told them yeah. and, and I can give you a lot of more example the wall jump uh -huh. that's from a fan right. okay it's the 30th of January 2015 and Miguel leaves behavior now, a lot of people have theories why Miguel left. Some people were claiming that Miguel was just cutting his losses on the game and moving on, whilst others were wondering if he had been forced out and not been allowed to make the game he wanted to make. Miguel says on Reddit that his position was abolished and he had to move on. This was because Miguel was a head of studio, not a producer. Essentially, Behaviour wanted to have one CEO or head of studio controlling their games and not multiple people on each project. So you may ask, who stepped in to fill Miguel's role? Well, enter Nathan. Nathan Richardson was made the senior producer for Eternal Crusade. And Nathan was no joke, he had worked as a senior producer on EVE Online, so he definitely knew his sci-fi MMOs. Nathan also knew his lore very well, reading over a hundred Black Library books, and also stated that he was going to be very similar to Miguel, taking a lot of the community's feedback for the game. But there was just one problem. Nathan, unlike Miguel, was a realist. And when he joined Eternal Crusade's team, and had seen all the things Miguel had promised, he knew he had to be honest and tell the truth. Now remember, up to this point, the game is in pre-alpha. That is very early in a game's development. All these people believed the promises Miguel had said that were going to be in the game before launch. And lastly, all the people that had spent over $80 on the Founders Packs were meant to have access to an alpha in early January. Nathan had to come forward and explain what was happening. June 24th, 2015. So you're not doing the massive battles anymore? Yes, we are. You are? Yes. Okay. But not at release? No. Okay, that's a little disappointing. What happened? Yes, so I mean, what happened is that there was a big dream. Yes. Right? And then I, then I came and crushed it. You crushed it yes, yourself. No, all my fault. You're just hate. no, that so, doesn't so, make any sense. So if you think about the dream, the dream was one server for the entire world. Okay. Uh, and also an open world like Skyrim, so like lots of content and huge territory. People playing in the United States, yeah. shooting up people playing yes, in Africa exactly, and exactly. UK, that's what it was. And, and then you also had thousand player battles. Yes. And it's a shooter. And vehicles and tanks and, yep. and it's all there. ships and flying things. But, but it as was you see, too it's much like, for yeah, you, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was too I much. mean, it's like, you know, games have done this individually, right? One or two of these things. Mm -hmm. um, doing them all together, mm -hmm was quite the ambition. I mean, and it, it is possible over time, especially because, I mean, in the beginning when we were thinking about it, and I, I mean, I, I say we, but I, I recently joined the team, um, but I'm, uh, I mean, the dream is still there. And to hear that it's no longer gonna be these massive battles at launch no. is a little depressing. Yes, and, uh, but so, they're still so massive. tell me when but we're gonna get- they're still massive. They're still massive. They're just at 1,000. Okay. Okay. You, you guys recently have announced that you're going to do an early access. Yes. And you actually moved up the early access. Yes, because we're moving so fast. And development's moving fast, so that's yeah. good to hear. And yeah. you said summer, which are, that's this month, yes. June, July, August. Yes. So we're about to get this thing yeah. right now. Yes. Are we, but how just many players part. are we going to get in that thing that comes out? So, so. Uh, you, it,
I want to play this part again because there's a very important thing that Nathan says that you might have missed. And development's moving fast, so that's yeah. good to hear. And yeah. you said summer, which are, that's this month, yes. June, July, August. Yes. So we're about to get this thing right yeah. now. Yes. Are we, but how just many? Now, there is a lot that happens in this interview, and I want to try and explain what Nathan was saying. Firstly, he says just then, the combat only for the Alpha. And this was part of Nathan's plan for Eternal Crusade. In this interview, he tries to explain that all of the things that Miguel promised were too expensive, but could be done further down the line. This means that they were going to start with the combat of the game and work their way up slowly to the other things. There was a very key problem with doing this, which I will explain later in the video at Asymmetric Balancing. This interview was Nathan trying to explain that they were still going to make the Eternal Crusade that everybody wanted, but it was going to take time. Sadly, this interview just becomes Angry Joe shouting about what he wants in the game. Like four buddies can go into like a tiered <laughs> hive, and I have no idea how it's gonna work. Well, so you how you tell so, me? So 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 I mean, you know, if we and then it's like enemies become temporary yes. uh, friends, but uh, yeah, we still yeah, yeah. hate well, each I mean, other. The, the, and once these things are dead, I'm gonna shoot yeah, you, bro. Yeah, exactly. Right? Wow, That's, that would be I mean, so cool. You're talking like maybe a human-controlled yes, carnifex yes. and just like murder I mean, marines and stuff. Yeah, I mean, we we. Please, can we put in the sisters I, of battle? I, 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 Do you know how fucking cool they are? Yes. They're battle nuns. I, and they I, flame things with flames. Totally agree. They don't get enough I, respect in the 40k universe. And I, oh, I would love Imperial Guards. Imagine like I, I like to call, I, I like to call it cannon fodder, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> care. It's still fun, even yes. if you know you're gonna get your ass. But they got tanks, the lemon russet. Yeah. Hang on one second. Huh, what do you know? Okay, enough of my shit jokes, but this interview was terrible and you don't have to take my word for it. People in the comments clearly said this as well. But what came after this is what doomed Eternal Crusade. Okay. And, well, and, and, okay, and there's another thing. Let's talk about that real quick because yeah. you initially sold the game as this idea yeah. and people paid in as yes. founders. Yes. So how is that going to work out? You sold them a different game and yes. now you're doing the smaller thing that will eventually be the bigger yes. game, and that's how it's being justified. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, based on what we went through and 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 seeing, like, because I mean, we were relying on technology that we were going to buy in and make a lot of this possible. Yeah, that that Google stuff. The, they, I don't yeah, know what it was, but it was this amazing thing. So yes. you guys and that, bought that technology, and it didn't work. Yes, and it's, and it's not not just one thing; it's a couple of things, right? Well, you you guys need to. <laughs> As you guys can imagine, this caused civil war. Warhammer fans have always been people that have not been easy to please. I'm guilty of it myself. If any of you have seen my Dawn of War 3 video, you will know how much of an idiot I act in it. And I'm trying to improve on not doing that. But the reason I'm talking about this is because from the very start of Eternal Crusade's development, people were fighting over the minor things in the game. And of course, when people heard that the game was changing from what Miguel had promised to what Nathan was working on, this sparked an even bigger problem. Eternal Crusade's fanbase split into two. On one side, you had players demanding refunds, saying they had been lied to all this time. And on the other side, you had players trying to explain to the other group that they were still going to get the game they were promised, but it was going to take time. Outpost. Yes, one outpost. One outpost early and, uh, that's access. Part okay. of a, uh, that's part of a territory. And, okay. and in a territory, you have, uh, you know, three, four other outposts. These, mm -hmm. are, these, these, these we would like to be about 100 plus battles. Mm -hmm when we launch. Okay. Okay. But then uh, we add the, like, the fortress and the fortress flips, like flips who actually owns that, that territory. Okay. But it's still map based. The next part we, we do is actually we remove the barriers between those outposts and the fortress and that territory becomes one, one open territory. world. Now I understand. Yeah, so one world. Individual matches. Yes. Obviously, everybody in the community probably didn't watch that interview, so they wouldn't have heard Nathan's plan in creating the Eternal Crusade they paid for. People started spreading theories that turned into rumours that then turned into people actually preaching this stuff about there not being an open world game. One YouTuber at the time that did try to explain to people that open world is still happening is Zoran the Bear. 
He tried to explain to people that if you actually watched the live streams the behavior you were doing, they were clearly showing step by step how they were going to do open world. So for launch, how this is going to work. So here you can see we zoom on one specific territory. The idea for your faction will be to take two outposts, at least. With two outposts, you unlock the possibility to attack directly the fortress. Uh, the stronghold is going to be the, the big battle with as many players as we can get in. At the moment, we cannot really give numbers because it's tech pending. The step after will be to remove the barrier between the fortress between the, and the outpost, meaning that the entire territory become a match. So at one point, what we want to be able to do, yes, that's the promise, the 500 player matches that will be grouping territories together. So for example, three territories together could be one big match uh, able to host about 500, uh, 500 players and even more from uh, the, the size of a regular MMO kind of big zone and you will get already this uh, real open world experience. But of course everybody was not watching these live streams so there was a massive barrier of communication. Ah oh, look there's a little alpha here in the comment section even he admits it didn't age well. One thing I have noticed is that when Nathan is talking about open world in Eternal Crusade, he tries to steer the conversation away from that, trying to convince people that is that actually what you want in the game? What we're driving towards right now is fun, mm -hmm. not an arbitrary number of like people in a battle yeah. or stuff like that. I mean, right. do we go the direction of having larger battles? Is, is that really where the fun is? Like we said 500 plus. Or is it actually more interesting that we actually have less people, but we have more points of interest on that same territory, which people are fighting over? Now, of course, this is just a theory. But to me, it seems like Nathan almost knew that open world was not going to happen. And he was trying to sort of insinuate to players that, look, we're trying to make the best game that we can, but open world isn't going to happen in the future. This doesn't help that they have actual live streams saying that they are going to do open world. But to me, it doesn't make sense why Nathan kept talking about like, is that fun? It just to me seems a bit weird. Anyway, enough of my opinion. Let's get back to the story. Okay, July 2015. Behavior make a very bold move. They switched to Unreal Engine 4. They claim this allowed them to speed up development and also gave them access to a lot more tools for the game. And they also launched a lovely little gameplay trailer to go along with this. Proceed to this location. Weapons ready. Okay, brothers, we have our orders. Time to move. Everybody protect the tactical at all cost. Mike, get on the rooftop. Yeah, okay. Let's do this. On me, squad! Go, go, go! Enemy sighted! Round the corner here. Go, go, go! Watch out for that guy. Ah! I'm getting shot, I'm getting shot. Drop him, drop him! I got your back. I think the capture point's right up ahead. Contact, contact! You guys continue, I'll hold him back. Oh, nice one! I'm suppressing these guys, follow up. Grenade! Ah, uh, he got me. We'll hold him here as long as we can. Keep going! I want it! Don't fail us on this one, brother. I got these guys. Good kill. Oh shoot, we're dying. Run, run, run! I think there's one left. Give me some cover. Coming! Trust me guys, it was tempting to do a reaction to this. But since last time, I've learned to calm myself and restraint. But I feel I need to do this video justice and show you what it would really be like. Yeah. Shut your fat Russian, Russian cunt mouth. mouth. I, did I did fine. You, you were just being retarded and fucking showing yourself. You didn't give a shit, you fucked up, you are 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 fucked up, you Let's talk about refunds. After the Great Civil War of Eternal Crusade, there was definitely some people that still wanted their money back. And it's a fair request as they were advertised one thing and sold another. Obviously, that's illegal. There's not a lot of information to go off on this, but apparently you were able to get a refund before the first Eternal Crusade Alpha. But I don't think it was advertised very well, and people to this day still claim that they weren't offered a refund. So if anyone actually has insight into this, I'm sure it would be appreciated. So Behaviour gives out refunds to people who request, but this costs them money. Money out of their pot that funds the game. This results in them unfortunately having to find a publisher. This was not the only factor that forced them to do this, but more on that later. 
September 23rd, 2015. Remember those people who became founders spending over $80 and were meant to get an alpha in January? Well, they've had to wait eight months till September now to finally get in. And don't forget, you're under an NDA, so you can't talk about what you see in the game. But arguably, this was one of the best times in Eternal Crusade's life cycle. People were playing the game for the first time, and there was a lot of positivity around what people wanted to see in the game. This all changed when the publisher showed up. Gather around, children. Let me teach you a lesson on gaming publishers. They love money and don't give a shit about devs or you, the consumer. And that's lesson over. Your homework is to subscribe. Only if you want to. It just motivates me. January 2016. Bandai becomes the publisher for Eternal Crusade and their first move is to force behavior to put the game out on early access on Steam. Fuck publishers man. Sorry to those devs that had their game forced out before it was ready. Of course this flooded the game with bad reviews and this was because they were marketing it as a finished game. So this trailer comes out with the early access on Steam and it's just plain up false advertising. It shows Thunderhawks being shot down which aren't even in the game. The Tyranids were not even in the game at this point, they were several months out and they were advertised here as attacking a PvP stronghold which is definitely not what they are in the final product. And the cherry on top is that Bandai had the audacity to put in the description select one of four factions, persistent world at war, massive battles. It is just plain up a lie. The Orcs and Eldar weren't even in the game at this point, they were several months out. So Bandai get their investment back and it leaves behavior to pick up the pieces. Basically, Bandai have sold the game as a finished product and now expect behavior to patch the game into that finished product. Between 2016 and 2018, the devs tried to make the game that was promised. They added the Tyranids as a PvE horde mode. The Orcs and Eldar were added later down the line, but had massive balancing issues with the other two factions. The game had multiple bugs that had to be ironed out, and the money for the game was running out. This forced them to make the game free to play, but only gave you access to one class and very slow progression. This caused more bad reviews of the game to come out and no new players were buying Eternal Crusade. 18th of January, 2018. Nathan admits that the game is dead. He admits that the game is not what was promised, but he claims he's still going to try and make the game that everybody wants. Obviously, that doesn't happen. October 30th, 2018. Nathan leaves Eternal Crusade, and this sparked an interesting discussion. So one YouTuber that I was following for Eternal Crusade's life cycle was Chapter Master Varrock. He had been there from the start and he was great at giving updates on the game. When Nathan left, Varrock and Miguel had a little bit of a back and forth on Twitter. Varrock was coming from the side that the backers of the game should have been told the truth and that should not have been lied to and given their money back. Miguel agrees with this, but then claims that only the head of the studio can make that decision. Varak then goes on to say, why make promises if you can't deliver on them? Miguel then replies, it's called life, and the external changes force them to make this decision. Not a great reply. I have a great meme for this, hang on. His injuries appear chaos inflicted. You are certain? of this charge. Miguel Cannon has been corrupted by Chaos Inquisitor Thrax. I am no heretic. You lie. But my favorite faction is Chaos, personally. None of that previous stuff matters. What Miguel says next is truly important. Miguel replies, business owners make the call on how they push their business forwards. Employees, even executive employees, have two choices then. Do the best they can following the orders of the owners or resign. That is life. Employees don't control the business, we only influence it as best we can. If you're a game developer, you will know that this speaks volume. I am now going to give my opinion and explain what happened to Eternal Crusade. Look at me. I look like a ripe Warhammer simp with this beard, okay? I'd, I mean, if you can even call this a beard. 
Okay, like I didn't have this when I first started this video. It just shows how long I've been doing this fucking video. And oh man, I need a haircut so bad. But anyway, so this part in the video, I'm not gonna. It's not a review of the game or the Eternal Crusade because I mean, Eternal Crusade had so many problems. But what I want to try and do now is come from a neutral standpoint, from a consumer, a publisher, and a developer standpoint, and try and explain why I think this game failed. And it really came down to two things poor decision making and a massive barrier of communication so let's start with what Miguel was talking about in that tweet first thing I want to say is that I'm not defending Nathan or Miguel for their actions Miguel promising all that stuff for Eternal Crusade and then leaving was definitely not good and Nathan is in the exact same boat as Miguel. He promised many things and didn't deliver on them as well. However, there is a bunch of things that happens behind closed doors that Miguel and Nathan probably couldn't talk about. Publishers can be very controlling over their games, and I can 100% bet you that the publishers forced them to put the game out on early access. And because of the reviews of the game, the publisher probably cut the budget to the game as well. And the reason Miguel and Nathan could not talk about this is because they were under a non-disclose agreement. And even if that contract ended, allowing them to talk about it, if you slag off game publishers, word spreads fast and you don't get hired. 99% of the time, developers are never the ones to blame. Of course, I do understand that at the start of Eternal Crusade, Behaviour were the ones working on the game. And that's where their poor decisions come in, which I will talk about in a second. This, of course, does not absolve Miguel or Nathan from their actions. But however, just having tunnel vision on Nathan and Miguel is definitely not fair either. This is what Miguel was trying to hint at in his tweet, that publishers will make a decision and the developers have to stand in the spotlight and own it. The funding of Eternal Crusade was a mess. First off, Miguel claims that everything he had talked about in the game so far was already fully funded. They then offered the Founders Program, which was not a Kickstarter, but also was not a crowdfunding, even though everybody knew that it was a crowdfunding. In the gaming industry, if a game does not have a publisher, then that is a massive red flag. Making a triple A game to the quality of what Eternal Crusade was promising was going to cost millions and there is no way Behaviour had the money to do this. What Behaviour should have done for Eternal Crusade is offer a Kickstarter similar to what Iron Harvest did, where they clearly show, depending on how much money gets put into the game, shows how much they can do with the game. Miguel did the opposite and promised no matter how much money you put into that pot, you will still get the game that I've promised. This is why the Pico server technology was a massive problem, because it was very new back then and extremely expensive to buy. A little bit of PvE element, but mostly it's a PvP and it's for faction. That's another very important point for it to work, because you need to have a asymmetric balance uh, for a game like this to, to work. What I mean by asymmetric balance is, let's say you look at a chessboard, uh, the chessboard is 100% symmetric, right? But your uh, black pawn and my white queen is not symmetric. But you can still eat my queen with your pawn depending of the strategy that you use in the game. So it's exactly the same way. So we have the Space Marine, which will equal, we know, we even surveyed our fan, is 40% of the population. And then you have Chaos, Eldars, and then we have the Orcs. So the Orcs and the Orcs Premium, uh, like the knobs and all these type of Orcs, they're uh, part of the four factions. Just for a bit of background about me, I was an eSports pro player in the game Evolve. Now, I'm not here to defend or talk about Evolve, but Evolve was a 4v1 game, or to put it in other words, it was an asymmetric game, where you would have four hunters versus one monster. And I had friends who knew the devs, and they said balancing this game was near to impossible. And trying to balance it costs a lot of time, which slows down development of the game and also costs a lot of money. This was one of the poor decisions that was made for Eternal Crusade. And this was one of the reasons why the development of the game was taking so long, because they were trying to balance an asymmetric game. Miguel describes this as playing two-way chess. The problem was he was playing four-way chess with the Eldar, Space Marines, Chaos Space Marines and Orcs. And by balancing one, you would nerf the others, and by buffing another, you would nerf one. Basically, 
impossible. And this was one of the biggest mistakes that Nathan did. Nathan spent development time and funding on trying to balance the combat of the game. The problem with doing this is that he was then going to increase it into larger battles being open world, which was then going to change the balance once again. It is impossible to balance four factions, different skill levels of players, and different equipment on players. 2021. What is the state of Eternal Crusade currently? Getting into a match is basically impossible with long loading times, but there are a few play times where people actually get on and you will be able to find a match. I want to say right now that if you enjoyed Eternal Crusade and you like the direction that Eternal Crusade went in, good on you. There's nothing wrong with liking a game and I hope it continues to give you fun. Of course, this depends on how long they leave the servers up for. So what did we learn? Well, you can't trust early access and we're still waiting for that Warhammer game we're all waiting for. It's been your boy Poncha. Thank you very much for watching.